Hi, I'm Mara Webster with InCreative Company and thank you for joining us for one of our talks today. Today we're so lucky to be joined by the fantastic Nick Mohammed to talk all about Ted Lasso as well as his show Intelligence. And starting with Ted Lasso, I wanted to talk about those early stages in terms of thinking about Nate's arc and how that first table read and having conversations with Jason early on gave you details of what was to come even before you had all the scripts for the, se the first season and how that really allowed you to think very specifically about the pacing of his journey and how you really wanted him to gradually find that voice and find his confidence in more ways where you weren't kind of rushing to the end too quickly and really having yeah. that payoff episode by episode. Yeah, um, it, 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 yeah, it was absolutely a thing of, of just not wanting to peak too early really. So I got, I got sent, I think maybe the first once I'd been cast, I think I got sent maybe the first three scripts, I think. Um, but they were obviously, you know, not necessarily sort of still writing, but, you know, they're doing tweets and they didn't want to sort of send anything out too soon. And we were filming over quite a long time period. So they would, they would cling on to them, but, but, but Jason and, and the other writers, they were, they were so great at giving us key details in terms of what certain things meant, you know, if we'd not shot them, what that was kind of alluding, uh, alluding to or, or, or what you might be filming next, which would sort of, that would pay off or something. So I remember particularly after that table read of the pilot, uh, Jason explaining uh, what happened, you know, I guess those key milestones for Nate. So I think episode seven is, is when he does the roast uh, to the players and how that was a kind of real key turning point in terms of his confidence and, uh, and you know, ending with him in episode 10 of him being promoted. So. Yeah, there were there were there were key points, and I guess yeah, it was just a case of not wanting to to rush too much. I guess if you know he's still he, he is a an awkward fellow is is Nate, and still is even in season two. But he's just you know he's still still trying to work things out in his head. I think a little bit in terms of now he's got a little bit more responsibility and uh, power, I guess, because he's got somebody beneath him. And but he's still socially awkward and doesn't really know how to interact with human beings still. And uh, yeah, I guess it was just, I, I would always ask lots of questions and just make sure that I wasn't getting too ahead of myself. Weird, weirdly, I, I think I'm asking more, well, I was asking more questions in season two, the, the season one arcs felt, I, I felt that I could connect to it in terms of, it felt quite the classic story of an underdog, uh, you know, who we're then rooting for and then who we eventually see succeed. Um, and I, I completely understood that. I think season two, and obviously I won't give anything away, but it's, it's a lot more of a kind of a, a bumpy journey for Nate. And um, there are some big moments for Nate uh, coming up, which we haven't seen yet uh, in terms of his his journey. And, uh, but yeah, they're so great. I mean, they're so smart, those writers and, you know, the creators, they, you know, they, they've sort of got it all mapped out in their heads for like, you know, three seasons. They know exactly what this specifically relates to uh, in, you know, a season's time. And uh, uh, there are kind of callbacks, which are back from episodes way back and even back into like the first season as well. So yeah, they're, they're just really smart. And um, yeah, I mean, it's a joy to play a character where you, you know, it's, it's part of an ensemble and, you know, it's a minor part in some respects, uh, certainly in season one, because, you know, he's he's quite, you know, camera shy in a way. And uh, uh you know to kind of go on a journey it's it's a real treat because you don't always have that i think usually if you're a certainly with uk sitcoms if you're a part of an ensemble you, your job is to almost be the constant and and the, the more major players are the ones who, who develop and uh, they kind of bounce off you and, and you're kind of useful to be in a sort of a place of consistency whereas it's very nice for, for for nate to have that little little journey and I like the way that you were describing some of his awkwardness being that he's still trying to figure things out in his head. And yeah. I feel like you can really see that in the delivery of lines and the way that you play with the dialogue in the fact that sometimes he starts committing to something and then he pulls back a little bit. Sometimes he chickens yeah. out on what he's saying. And so you really play with the rhythm and, and how that flows a lot as well. And was that something that when you first started reading the scripts was very clear to you that that was going to be kind of the rhythmic timing? Or do you still find yourself playing around with what that leans to look like for a particular scene sometimes um I think I think in season one I you know I sort of, sort of tried to sort of find the character you know when I was first ca casting for it I guess but then the more and I think this is true for everyone that they they cast pretty much they then started writing for those particular voices or a particular intonation and 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 with Nate you know I, I kind of gave him a, a bit of a stutter at the start uh, not not so much a stutter but but uh but you know he, he would often sort of repeat himself and and like you're saying sort of start sentences and then kind of draw back a little bit and then sort of have to repeat himself 
the clarity and 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 then they started writing little bits of that in um with with season two and and you know we, we're obviously what four episodes in now uh, you know the fifth episode's coming out very soon um it's a different starting point for Nate you know he has got this you know this sort of slight you know he doesn't quite know how to deal with the fact that he is in a more of a position of responsibility and he has somebody beneath him now which he's never had before and he doesn't really know how to talk to Will he's sort of he's almost a bit of a bully to him which is strange because you know Nate was bullied and and I think audiences have absolutely sort of thought oh what well, this is weird for Nate to be like that but it's because he doesn't he doesn't he doesn't know how to deal with what he's been given he's still the same guy and yeah he's been promoted but he's still he's still got all of his insecurities and his demons and uh, you know that lack of confidence I think is still there bubbling away in the background and I won't give anything away but it's interesting to see where that goes later on in in season two and um, it's also just very interesting to play because as I said the season one story arc for Nate was very I think familiar and you know you could you could relate to it the underdog sort of does good but but now it's like well now he's done good where now like what happens next and uh it, it's in, it's well I won't give anything away because if I keep speaking I will <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to suddenly disappear at the behest of Apple <laughs> no <laughs> <laughs> no but with, with the, the idea that he is getting every you know what he's wanted and, and having that trajectory and, and finding his voice as well he's also in this interesting middle ground because he's not quite sure who he is as an assistant coach yet and how that mm -hmm. influences his player you know his dynamic with the players and then at the same time he's still kind of got one hand in in his old job and and the way that he's overseeing will and the fact that he does care about the details and he does notice things like the scented fabric softener because he was thinking about those details every single day for years even if nobody else was um yeah and so do you do you kind of like to play around with that push and pull between those two spaces where he he doesn't he hasn't quite landed his feet in either space fully yet yeah, I think I, absolutely, and and it's quite it's quite deliberate where those sort of pushes and pulls are, and I think it varies from character to char character. I mean, the episode five that's about to come out, you know, we see him interacting with um with Keeley sort of substantially, sort of for the first time, really. I mean, you know, obviously there's been small interactions in season one, but he you know he goes in to see her and to actually get her advice on something, and you know you would never Nate would well he would absolutely never have had the confidence to do that in season one. So there's absolutely new new territory there, and I think Keely and uh, and Rebecca um, to a degree are two people that he you know he he's he hasn't had many interactions with, so that's still very new territory for him. So he does stumble and he gets embarrassed and he's awkward. But then with with Will the kit man, you know this is a job that he knows you know back to front, and you know he absolutely comes down comes down on him harsh when he feels that he's not pulling his weight because you know Nate you know lives and breathes AFC Richmond, and he absolutely wants to do absolutely everything he can to see the team succeed and you know he even sees it in the small details of oh you, you know you, you can't distract the players with fabric softener and so you know and that that's crazy that's absolutely you know he's he's deluded in that respect but um but it, it, it's part of who, who he is and uh he kind of can't see past that he's got quite a blinkered view has Nate but um but yeah he 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 I guess he's almost got categories of people and even with the players he's he's still finding his way because some of these players were people who who bullied him a little bit um and some of these players even though you know they've kind of got past that he Nate can't really see past that and um we definitely later on sort of see some um repercussions of uh of how he was treated in, in season one but with Nate sort of maybe taking the maybe taking the upper hand there uh and yeah it's a bumpy road for him for sure yeah and with the fact that you were bringing up the idea that because of this arc and because of this confidence and the fact that he's now on the coaching team that that gives him space with other characters <coughs> like Keely and with with Rebecca where he didn't spend as much time with them before mm -hmm. how has that actually also evolved the way that you're working with a lot of the cast on scenes because there's a totally different dynamic that you're playing to yeah. with them now as he's kind yeah. of on this upward trajectory well, it's, re it's really fun because, you know, getting, I mean, obviously, you know, we were all hanging out on set anyway, but we, I mean, not so much with, with you know, season two filming during COVID, but in terms of, you know, season one, we, we were sort of established as a company. So, you know, we, we, we'd, we'd hang out so socially, but it was then great to then come into season two and then get to sort of play with the people who are, you know, who are now your mates, but you've not really done scenes together with. So that, that was always fun. And also, it, it, yeah, you, you kind of found new dynamics and sort of new fun ways for, you know, characters to interact because you've not really played in that way before. Um, and, you know, 
Juno and Hannah are just so great, <laughs> great. And you know, often we would sort of fall about laughing because we just it, it felt it felt very unfamiliar. And I remember specifically before Brett. Uh, uh, this is a bit. Uh, hang on, let me make sure I'm not giving anything away. In episode five, we there, which is about to come out, I think, very soon as to when this is going out. Um, you know, Roy comes back, and you know, we we get to have a bit more kind of Roy time as part of AFC Richmond, as opposed to the stuff that we've been seeing Roy doing up until now. And uh, I remember when we were filming episodes one to four of season two, we genuinely missed Brett in the locker room because. You know, he was such a permanent fixture in season one of all the locker room scenes. And so it's strange in a way that you kind of, even though, you know, when you watch the show, it doesn't probably feel like that. But when we were filming it, all of uh, Brett's stuff was completely separate for those first few episodes. And uh, uh, so, yeah, you kind of, some of those dynamics, and even the diamond dog scenes, you know, the, 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 that's a very sort of specific dynamic. And um, when we get to film those scenes, it's like, ah, oh, yeah, we're doing the diamond dog scene. This is a very particular flavor. We all have a, a specific place where we sit or stand and um and actually when then people come into those diamond dog scenes it's quite fun because uh there's sort of an established um chemistry there maybe but yeah it's it, you know listen it's it's such a fun show to be a part of and there's so many different aspects to it so yeah but with that idea that with, there are certain scenes where there's a specific blocking in a certain place that you're you're sitting or standing, that's also something that's changed with this trajectory as well, because it used mm. to be very much that we'd see Nate on the edge, you know, on the outskirts of the room, on the outskirts of the group. And now we're seeing him much more in the center and, you know, side mm. by side with with Coach Beard and with Ted Lasso as well. And so has it changed a lot of the blocking and choreography for scenes as well? A, a little bit. And it becomes more prevalent. I think it, it becomes more... Uh... Ob obvious is not even the right word. It, there's, there's, I can't give anything away, but there's, there's certain blocking in, in like the latter, like episodes 10, 11 and 12, which are very, very telling in terms of um, the hierarchy within the kind of the group of, of coaches really. I can sort of speak around that a little bit. And, um, and yeah, that's, that's very deliberate. And actually the, the, the sort of the awkwardness of, of Nate in sort of episodes sort of one to four, where he's sort of, you kind of like, what, what is this? This isn't quite the Nate that we kind of know and love from season one, but it's sort of giving bits of it. But that, that it's so, you know, they're such good writers. They're, they're so smart and, and, you know, directors as well in terms of the, the placing of Nate in those scenes is meant to feel slightly off and slightly skew if and slightly like, ah, oh, this is unfamiliar. Um, and just when you sort of think that, Nate is maybe sort of falling into step or, or kind of sort of getting a handle of who he is and where he fits now within the, the world of, of, of Ted Lasso, you know, something else uh, upsets it. I also love that he at times is playing an idea of who he thinks a football coach is to the point oh, yeah. where he's on the sidelines of the field in a button up shirt and a tie and always making sure that he's dressed to the nines when nobody else is dressed that way anywhere near yeah. him. Um, yeah. And at what point did, did details like that start coming into play? They're very, it's quite scripted actually. Uh, you know, often it'll be the suit stuff is, is quite um, uh, specific because the, the gray suit is is the suit that Ted bought Nate in the gala episode of season one. So those kinds of references are, you know, are, are actually scripted. It's like Nate is wearing the suit that Ted got him in episode four of season one. You know, so that that stuff is quite deliberate. And then we'll, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll tweak little bits in terms of, you know, Nate's journey in season two, you know, particularly sort of from now onwards you know, I won't give anything away, but the, there are, you know, every aspect of his sort of styling in terms of costume, make, you know, everything is sort of supporting where he's going from a, <laughs> I can't speak without giving anything away, it's so difficult. But uh, let's do this again when all 12 episodes are dropped, right? <laughs> we'll talk after Friday. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> even just the upcoming episode I know is like hugely, yeah, hugely central quite... to him as well. Um, is, you know, yeah, one, yeah. Of the, one of the things that audiences are going to get to see in that episode is more elements of, of Nate and his family. But I love the way that you've always been able to play to that as part of his character. There's always little references to Christmas mm. Day with his family. We had his niece's mm. suggestion box in the first season, mm -hmm. which was a pivotal mm -hmm. prop. And so even though you weren't necessarily playing scenes with his family members on the show before um what are the ways in which you found yourself really shaping a lot of those details into who he is and who he's become because of his family and that closeness yeah definitely i think um yeah it's important that 
we kind of learn a little bit about where Nate has come from and, you know, why he is who he is. And um, it wouldn't be, I don't think it's giving anything, it wouldn't be unsurprising to know that his insecurities come from his relationship with his with his father, which actually it was quite a running theme in the whole show. You know, the father-son or the kind of mentor-mentee relationship is kind of key throughout Ted Lasso. And I don't, I'm, I'm not meaning in terms of sort of to do sort of specific gender on it, but in terms of just generally speaking, it's the kind of mentor-mentee uh, theme is is prevalent in lots of kind of characters' backstories and where they're, you know, their, their journeys. And um, yeah, uh, we get to, we get to sort of finally see a little bit of, of, of why Nate is who he is and um, ho- hopefully maybe forgive some of his slight, slightly kind of odd behaviour that we've now seen in, in season two, which feels out of character, but not to justify it or to condone it, but but um, we might actually kind of learn as an audience, ah, oh, well, that's, that's why he's behaving like that, you know. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I've, I've actually not seen episode five yet. Myself. I mean, obviously I know it because I got the scripts, but um, and we filmed it. But but still, I kind of, you know, I, I like, I get forward to, I look forward to every Friday. We're like, ah, oh, I can't wait to see how this has turned out. And But also you get to see obviously what everyone else has been doing in the scenes that you've not been in as well. So I can't, you know, I can't wait to see that one. And one of the things I think is so great about structurally how the show comes together is that it is so specifically scripted with so many elements of detail in every Mm. single line of delivery. And at the same time, it always seems like there's there's a journey and everything feels malleable of like, you know, is there something else we can do to just punch this up a little bit more in terms of the journey when you're shooting scenes? And particularly now Mm. that you're shooting so many scenes uh, with Brendan Hunt and with Jason Sudeikis, and, you know, they obviously have such incredible improv backgrounds. You've got your fantastic comedy background as well um do you find has there been like an evolution in the dynamic between the three of you and how you start to play around and how you start to find those moments together a, a, a little bit I mean I you, you know we're, we're all obviously a lot you know we just because we've done one season already you know there's a, there's a shorthand sometimes to uh, a particular beat or an emotion or a you know a payoff or you know what this is sort of not necessarily uh, well, what's like, you know, analogous to a moment that we've had in season one or what this might be uh, pointing towards. And uh, and yeah, I mean, most of the time I just try not to laugh because they're so good at, you know, you know, r- riffing riffing on the scene and, you know, coming up with new lines here or there. Um, and sometimes I get forewarning and often I don't. <laughs> and, uh, and I, you know, I'm just uh, an absolute mess and ruining, ruining some very important scenes but they uh yeah it's it you know it's it they 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 collaborate in really nice you know they'll they'll always will always get a chance to to rehearse the scene on set fully and 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 play around with it a little bit more and switch lines over and you know make sure it sounds right in my my accent and stuff and I think um there's but there there it is incredible and I and I still don't know how they do it but the level of detail that they can contain in 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 their heads that you know that they've all you know they've already mapped out stuff for season three and I know they're thinking of literally to the point of where certain props the significance of certain props and where they need to be placed and what's written on the walls and you see a little bit of it on Twitter and you see fans of the show going have you seen what's written on the whiteboard have you seen what this means and and it is the detail and I sometimes you know I know we're just they're about to call action and Brendan Brendan will suddenly jump up from his seat and go oh hang on and he'll scrub something from the whiteboard and change a number or change a letter and you're like I have no idea what that stuff means (laughs) it's all football stuff but it's 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 detail that they've kind of got their eye on which um you know it's it's incredible how they've, they've 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 got it all playing out in their heads um and there's a there's a key thing that happened in episode four in the Christmas episode, um, which uh, pays off in episode 12, which I've not seen, but um, obviously I've read and, and I've spoken. And Bill Lawrence actually texted me about that specific moment. And uh, w- once episode 12 has dropped, we can maybe talk about it or I'll tweet about it or something. And it, and it honestly, when I read it, I was like, <gasps> like this. And, uh, and it's, and it's, it's just about it's just about a prop actually it's not about anything it's not a person it's not a character but it's a really important thing and it just absolutely tore me into <laughs> oh god but also with with that idea of of 
how there's a, a continued and developed intimacy and, and rapport with co-workers, sorry, co-stars. I wanted to talk about Intelligence, which is the show that you created and wrote and show run and star in it alongside David Schwimmer, because I think it's so great that that dynamic was, was partly born out of another pilot that you'd been co-writing yeah. on and the two of you improvising. And that was where the dynamic between these two characters mm -hmm. came from. And so having had the opportunity to go into writing the scripts for the first season with already a bit of a sense of what that dynamic was going to be, but then going back for see when you were writing season two mm -hmm. with a deeper understanding of that but also seeing how all of the cast members were taking on these characters mm -hmm. how did that really change your process and your journey and the evolution you feel like you were able to take the scripts onto with that in mind yeah well it was a lot it, not not easy but it was a lot easier than season one because you know i it, it was it's a slight double-edged sword but we've been given have we been given two seasons off the bat? We've definitely been given season one without a pilot of intelligence. And, um, and you know, I, I, I think it's fair to say that it's because, you know, David was attached to the show and, you know, David's incredible. And, um, uh, but I think in another world, we would probably have had a, a pilot first. And, it, and I say a double-edged sword because I think there are, there are some real, you know, it's expensive to do a pilot and then to sort of criticize it and then go back to filming a series if you get picked up. But um it's um it's really useful because you can see specifically what dynamics work and you know things you might change and you know there's so much and and you know then there's a sort of shooting style and you know ton, tons that you can learn from a pilot so you know in a in a roundabout way series one of intelligence you know was our very expensive pilot you know and there was a lot uh, i love about that first season but there's also little bits and pieces that I'm like oh we should have done that but well, I, I can look and so we all had you know a huge learning curve and even just in terms of the casting of it, apart from David, who obviously plays Jerry and is, you know, is written for David, um, and Jane Stannis, who plays Mary, who I'd worked with before, in fact, on that same uh, pilot that Schwim was involved in, um, which was co-written uh, by Julia Davis. Um, I'd, I'd wrote the part of Mary for, for Jane. Every, everyone else was cast. Um, and as soon as, and, you know, we're such an odd bunch of people, you know, such an odd ensemble, you know, we, uh, you know, real mixtures of ages and attitude you know it's it's and and deliberately so because the characters are all uh very different but um you know it's and it's such a lovely group of people as soon as i you know you have those voices in your head and having done season one and learned what we've learned from doing that it, it felt so much more uh there was a, we, we could just sort of attack sort of season two with a lot more of a spring in our step because we knew what we were doing and we knew you know what pairings work together and what new things we you know we could add to the mix and to make those those things even more exciting so so yeah it was it was a huge learning curve and it just meant that season two we could sort of hit the ground running and uh and, you know hopefully an audience felt that as well who were kind of coming back to the show because you know they'd invested the time in these characters they knew who they were and now season two uh, you can just sort of have fun with it because we know what the setup is we know who these characters are and you know how they interact and we know totally you know where the show is because I think totally season one is you know it, it varies a little bit whereas you know I've, I've always really thought of intelligence as a cartoon you know, it's like a live action cartoon it's very silly lots of slapstick in it uh and you know it, it treads a fine line occasionally there's some sort of darker notes in there but um uh you know we really really played up to that in season two you know the amount of stuff physical stuff in there is is huge and partly because we've got a cast who can really do it you know David of course you know he's just an amazing clown you know the physical stuff that he can do is phenomenal so um it would have been you know remiss of us to not to sort of play up to those strengths I think and one of the physical moments that you know I was, I was curious if it just kind of almost wrote itself once you got to the point of filming it is the moment yeah. where your character is trying to demonstrate waterboarding on one of his colleagues oh yeah and just holding up yeah. one of those giant jugs and was that something where when you were writing a moment like that that you just you know exactly yeah. what that's going to look like and how that's going to play Comple once you get set? Com yeah completely because because it's a combination of things it's sort of me being quite short and you know sort of just trying to hold a you know water cooler and above Jane who's sort of shy and you know timid you know her character is sort of and then you know Schwim as Jerry sort of barking orders from down below but he keeps on getting you know keep on pouring it on him by accident rather than on Jane and so it's just just that as just an idea I I mean I still like I'm sort of grinning about it now it just makes me laugh just as a as a kind of a setup and um it was actually quite difficult to film because it's sort of like lots of like weird angles and and you know genuinely that thing was just quite heavy because you sort of kind of can't really act that you want it to sort of look full and sort of feel full so um 
uh, or I certainly couldn't act it. I'm just not good enough, good enough act, <laughs> to act that something is heavy if it's not heavy. Um, uh, so yeah, that, that that's absolutely an example. And that, I remember that and in season one, the, the, the card entry scene, the, the, when the pass, the card pass keeps failing in the corridor and uh, Jerry uh, Schwimm's character is sort of busting for the loo um, and it keeps failing. That was another one where I was like, well, I can sort of inherently sort of see how we can edit, pretty much sort of, you know, sort of shoot that almost as a one, you know, in one shot, but yeah. And when you're coming up with a lot of the the scenarios that as an agency they're dealing with, you know, there's moments where there's a genuine national security threat happening and people's lives are in danger. And at the same time, none of that actual drama is happening in the room. We're never mm. seeing the outside world in the show at moments like that. So there's an interesting transference of having to create the conflict, you know, exactly like you were saying before with all of the details between the characters where there's a there's a bigger conflict, but you have to always have it land through the characters. So how do you navigate mm. coming up with the way that you really want to capture that element of slight tension yeah. and slight drama within the comedy and where the conflict yeah. should lie? It's 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 a tricky one for intelligence, and uh, because you know the base joke of the show is that you've got these huge stakes of national security, but you've got these really odd characters who are sort of more concerned about you know. Who sent them a Valentine's Day card, or Elaine's retirement drinks, or just sort of just sort of bumbling through life in their own way? Uh, but you know, there's, th on saying that, there's there's a there's a truth to that in that you know from our research, and you know, not saying that anyone at GCHQ is as odd as our kind of characters are, but 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 you know, it is it is a job which is a lot of number crunching, sat at a desk, hot desking. You know, you know, you just sort of get on with the work. You know, it's you 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 have to almost detach yourself from the, the high stakes reality of some of the things that you're doing and how they might play out. Because, you know, certainly, you know, if you really dig deep into, you know, some of the stuff that they're doing has enormous consequences and, you know, is horrifying some of the stuff they're dealing with or have to see or, you know. So I think finding, you know, it was quite deliberate that we never, we, we slightly skirt around the, the, the subjects because, you know, terrorist atrocities and, you know, sex trafficking, are, you know, are, are not funny in themselves, obviously. So it, it, you have to, the humour has to sort of come from a, a different place and sort of, it's sort of filtered through the characters. So we do, we we absolutely will, will name drop things that are happening uh, because that's true to the world. And, you know, those things happen on a daily, you know, GTHU are dealing on a daily basis with that kind of stuff and those levels of threats. Um, but I think it would be, it'd be asking too much of an audience to have to sort of to genuinely buy into that or you know as if it was a drama um or or, or in which or if it were a drama you would buy you you would have to sort of um uh i think delve into that stuff in a lot more detail but because we're a comedy and a very silly comedy at that um i think we've sort of given ourselves license to sort of skirt around the edges just enough to sort of um get away with it or that that's the hope that's and and i think season two i think we do I think we tread that line exactly how I wanted to. Um, season one, I think we were slightly finding our way. But that that journey of finding exactly what the line is and and where you can can push things. In terms of that, I wanted to ask about your collaborative relationship with Matt Lipsy, who's the director on the show. Mm. And it sounds like you, working with him that it's always let's you know if we're trying to figure out where the line is and we're not quite sure in a moment, let's try a couple of different versions and let's always have an alternate and always have a backup. Mm -hmm. um, and so then, how does that then feed a lot into the post production of the show and really using editing mm -hmm. to find that at that point of the process mm. as well? Yeah. Well, we yeah we so we yeah we absolutely um, you know we engage with Matt very early on with the scripts and um, you know there's we have a lot of it's very you know I write the show but but it's very collaborative and you know Schwim and uh, Schwim's uh, business partner who's uh, an exec on the show Tom Hodges um, you know they input and you know feedback with you know detailed notes and Neris and Morwenna expect it you know so we have a lot of notes kind of coming in the script editor uh, and Matt as well will feed in and um and the producer of the show so we you know there's a lot of input and then I sort of try and there's a slight kind of the good thing about that though is that there's there's a slight sort of wisdom of a crowd that if, if it feels that we're pushing a joke too far or that we're sort of overstepped to mark or certain things aren't landing or that the balance feels off usually amongst you know the seven of us that that will sort of be massaged into something that is ah now this feels appropriate and it feels that we can uh make light of this without it feeling that we're being uh flippant or um you know treading the wrong side of a line um and then when it comes to shooting it 
uh, there will absolutely be times when Matt will want to shoot alternatives because we're thinking ahead to the edit and thinking how, you know, just totally the show, just making sure that we're, uh, we're in the right place. But I remember specifically episode one of season two, which is sort of the, almost the real time episode, kind of a sort of almost Ch Chernobyl pastiche, the sort of a nuclear meltdown sort of thing happening. And they're trying, they've, you know, they've got literally 30 minutes to try and uh, crack the code. And, um, and we, 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 we struggled for a long time to try and find the right soundtrack for that particular episode, because uh, if you go too sort of dramatic, then it, it really undermines, you know, you, you, the comedy just doesn't really work because you, it, it's too, it feels too heavy, I guess, and you can't quite engage with the lightness of some of the dialogue. And so that was terrific, actually. And I believe it's his brother who who composes the, um, uh, or, or at least uh, it, it's co-composed by Matt's brother and somebody else who I forget the name, which is bad. Um, uh, but they did a great job. And I remember Matt just finding a really good sort of balance in terms of how it was shot, what what you know what 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 bits of the script we kind of used and what we tweaked on the day um and the whole kind of post-production side of it and, and and the music really kind of added to it just being a real kind of like nice little package and I was yeah I was really super pleased with that and yeah Matt I mean Matt's incredible and he's got his eye on so many things but yeah and then lastly, I want to talk a little bit about your your comedy when it comes to panel quiz shows and, and the idea of when you're coming on as Mr. Swallow on something like 8 out of 10 Cats, because I think what's so interesting about that dynamic is when you're coming in to do a segment on Dictionary Corner, you know that you have a specifically finite amount of time and whether it's you know the mathematical breakdown of the 12 days of Christmas or the Jurassic Park mm -hmm. theme tune, you have to have the audience inside the concept of what it is that you're doing so instantaneously. Mm -hmm. You don't have time to build them into the idea of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And so how do you set about structuring those types of, of segments comedically and performance wise? Well, well, a lot of them, um, a couple of them, you know, I wrote specifically for for the show for the for the for Catsters Countdown. But um, a, a lot of them were taken from you know live live sort of sets that I'd done, either as part of longer hours up in Edinburgh or in London, um, or just sort of club material that I worked on and gigged with. So, you know, a lot of it was quite fine tuned already in a sense that I knew how to kind of. Um, you know, communicate the, that sort of central premise or whatever with an audience relatively quickly, partly because, you know, Mrs. Follow is quite a great in character and you kind of, you kind of got to get on with, you know, you, if you stall too much, an audience will be like, oh, what, literally what is going on and who is this guy and why is he shouting at us? But, so I think um, with Mr. Swallow, it's always quite useful to kind of connect with the audience, the central idea, and then just sort of hit them with it and just like hope that they kind of ride that, that wave because uh, there's sort of nowhere else to go otherwise. And so, um, uh, I did, I recorded a, a new one a few weeks ago with a ridiculous idea. And, you know, I've not seen it, so um, who knows how it will turn out. And the idea is that it is Mr. Swallow going through his bag of bags, like, you know, people have a bag of bags under the sink or something. And he is singing just the, the names of the different bags, like Tesco bag and sort of H&M bag and things like that, to the to the tune of Moon, Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. I mean, it is the weirdest, the weirdest thing I think I've ever come up with. I have no idea. I've never tried it in front of audience before because of the pandemic. I wasn't gigging as much and filming and stuff. And so who knows? It's going to go out. It'll go out. I think it's going out on Christmas Eve because uh, it was the Christmas special that we shot. And yeah, it was bonkers. And, and they had a limited audience in for that recording because um, it was still a uh, social, socially distanced audience, audience at that point. Um, and, you know, they seem to enjoy it, but whether it's because they're completely baffled, I don't know. So so it's, I, I, I've kind of got to the point with Mr. Swallow where I feel there's enough of a, an audience for it that they kind of kind of know him or know, you know, n you know, they've seen the previous clips that they kind of sort of not know what to expect, but know tonally that he's just sort of an odd, an absolute oddball who will do random things. And um, yeah, so I'm hoping that that will, I'll be able to sort of ride a bit of a wave. Otherwise people might be like, nah, you've gone too far. This is, this is, this is just bad. <laughs> the, plastic the plastic bags that break it all. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that would be the straw that breaks the camel's back. Well, I look forward to seeing that. And it's always such a pleasure to watch you in all of these in endeavours. And thank you so much for all of this. And and hopefully we can chat again once you can actually reveal all the information about it. Oh, Nate. crikey. <laughs> but we, we've literally, we couldn't have timed this interview worse because I think from episode five onwards, things really start to hot up for Nate in terms of his story and what happens. I mean, episodes five, seven, 
11 and 12 and there's some big night like really big night <laughs> so I feel like yeah I'll have to kind of come on and explain myself in a lot more with a lot more clarity because I feel I've had to um uh, be very deliberately very vague but you know I can't have Apple will swoop down on me and stop my iPad from working or whatever it is so they do well nonetheless I appreciate being your worst timed interview of the season and thank you so much <laughs> no I don't mean it like that <laughs> No, I don't mean it like that. It's been wonderful. But yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me.